So we watch athletes on the field pat, catching passes for touchdowns or slam dunking the basketball or hitting a home run. And these athletes all have talent, but behind that talent is usually a coach or a trainer who can explain usually the science behind what they're doing, these maneuvers, why they do it, how it works. But you got to remember that that science has been researched by sports scientists and these sports scientists play an important role in developing and interpreting that research that the coaches and trainers use in order to improve the athlete's performance with a scientific basis. And these sports scientists, they usually do it behind the scenes, so you don't really know exactly what they're doing, but they definitely pave the way for these evidence-based programs that help maximize our athlete's potential. And they do that both safely and effectively. And they have some pretty cool tools, I, I can tell you. So today I'm joined by Dr. Neil Johansson from the LSU School of Kinesiology in Baton Rouge. He's also a researcher with Pennington Biomedical here in Baton Rouge, which is a world-renowned facility for research on obesity and exercise physiology. So Dr. Johansson has been an integral part of the research team on the LSU football team as well and other LSU sports. You know, working with the athletic trainers at LSU, that medical staff, he's participated in several studies on athletic performance. So I, I found no one better that I could ask. I invited Dr. Johansson to provide us a little bit of a perspective of his role, kind of behind the scenes of the science behind building peak performance in LSU athletes, but it could be applied to you know, any athlete that's out there. How do we use research? How do we use sports science to get our athletes to the next level? So thanks for joining us today, Neil. Yeah, great. I was going to say Neil is just fine. Dr. Johansson, I, I don't know that guy. <laughs> say that, that's my dad, right? That's right. All right. So tell us a little bit about your background, you know, your career, how you got to be where you are today at LSU. Yeah, sure. Um, so I actually come from South Dakota. I uh, did my bachelor's in chemistry at South Dakota State University in Brookings, South Dakota, uh, many, many, many years ago. Um, and I, I really wanted to be a medical doctor to, to start with. Um, my focus was in chemistry. I was actually mostly in biochemistry. Um, and, and like a lot of wannabe med students didn't get into medical school and, and was sort of at a loss and, and was picked up by a research uh, facility or program at South Dakota State called the Ethel Austin Martin program. And it's a program in human nutrition. It was run by Bonnie Specker for years and years, who was honestly my first mentor in research. And, and that was really sort of my first, first into to exercise physiology. You know, um, I, I was an athlete in high school and in college. I was a um, high jumped at, at South Dakota State while I was there. Um, so I do have some athlete experience, um, but really wasn't into the exercise physiology realm until I met met a guy that was part of these research studies that were going on with the Martin program at South Dakota State named Matt Vukovic. And, and Matt, an amazing scientist, an amazing pedigree. You know, he came out of uh, Dave Costell's lab at Ball State, uh, did his postdoctoral work with John Halsey at, at University of Washington in St. Louis, you know, and then went to South Dakota State. And, and I worked in this facility for about three years, that program for about three years. Um, and, and in that time, got to, know, got to know Matt really well, took his graduate exercise physiology class and everything sort of clicked. You know, I sort of went, this is really cool. You know, I get to use the medical side of, of, of physiology and I get to study athletics. And I get to study human performance and I get to study the effect of exercise on, on health and, and well, wellness. And, and asked him, I said, you know, where would you go? He said, well, you need to go study with Rick Sharp and Doug King at Iowa State, both of whom came from Dave Costell's lab at Ball State, which if you know anything about the exercise physiology world, everything somehow ties back to, to, to Dave Costell's lab at, at Ball State, you know, and, and uh, I studied with Rick. Um, I was really a bench chemist at that point. You know, I, I really loved to, to be in the lab. I was honestly sort of shy and, and sort of with, not withdrawn, but it's sort of an introverted personality and, and really love to sit in the lab. And we did, I think in the five years, I didn't start with a master's. So my master's and PhD took about five years. And it was, I think we completed eight studies there that, you know, 
of different varying types of protocols. We started in carbohydrate research and nutrition research with, you know, uh, exercise, trying to optimize performance in cyclists and then moved into the hydration realm. You know, we studied some stuff. We were funded by Campbell's Soup to look at the effect of pre-exercise chicken noodle soup intake on, on fluid balance and water intake during exercise. And, and, um, and, and loved it, right? Iowa State's an amazing place to, uh, for graduate students and still is, you know. Um, uh, and then came down to Baton Rouge to, to do my postdoctoral work and made a 100% shift in, in exercise world from bench chemistry and, you know, applied research to, to the clinical research. Uh, I studied with Tim Church mm -hmm. at, at Pennington in my postdoctoral research uh, where we did gigantic studies, you know, NIH uh, based studies to look at how exercise influenced health in people with diabetes, which was like the heart D study that we did. We looked at people overweight um, uh, and, and obese individuals and looking at different doses of exercise and how it influences feeding behavior and weight status. We've done stuff in older adults. And, um, and that's really my connection now back to Pennington um, where we've actually done some research now in, uh, in the tactical athletes in the military, you know, we were funded by the Department of Defense. We've done some stuff with uh, the fire departments here in Baton Rouge <clears throat> to to try and um, improve their health and well-being. And and there was an opportunity while I was a postdoc at Pennington that opened up at LSU, and I jumped on it. Uh, there was an open position here. I, I applied. I was offered a position at LSU. Jeez, nine years ago now. It seems like it was yesterday, but you know, nine years ago when I started here and, and was told, told two things, Phil. I was told, one, you'll never be able to draw bloods on campus because you can't do that. And two, you'll never be able to work with LSU athletics. And I went, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. You know, I, you know, I don't need to work with athletics. We, we started our own lab. We basically built a lab from nothing here at LSU to where we have some really nice physiology labs that, that we work out of. Um, and and I maintain this, you know, oversight or scientific director position for the exercise stuff that goes on at, at Pennington. Um, and that's really where I'm at now. You know, I, I, although about six years ago, we, we um, and, and you mentioned Ray Castle when we were offline, Ray Castle and I were sitting there talking and he says, you know who you need to meet? You need to meet Jack Marucci. You need to go over and meet Jack and Shelly Mullinex over at Athletics and, you know, see what you can do for them, see what you can do with them for research. And it's exploded. Like now we, I can't, I think we have 15 to 18 ongoing studies right now that are, you know, going on through the IRB. We, we've done everything from football to swimming to, you know, soccer to, you know, men's and women's sports alike and, and, and have graduated a lot of students that have had the opportunities through athletics to, to do research with them and, and to, to broaden their horizons in that, in that area of research. So we're very grateful for our, for our, our connections now between LSU kinesiology and, and LSU athletics. Yeah. It's really good to see that, <clears throat> that link. I know when I was there, you know, it, it was a, it was two, two silos. Um, and that we tend to see that in the industry of, of athletics and science and education don't always mix. I think in reality, the athletic training curriculum has helped to bridge a little bit of that gap because it did link sure. the kinesiology department, the education side. Again, when I was there, we didn't have a degree in athletic training. You know, we were student trainers and then on the side, you got your degree. Yeah. Whereas now it's very much integrated thanks to all the stuff that, that Ray's done. And of course, working with Jack and Shelly and yeah. the rest of the crew over there, it's really, it's really refreshing to see this after, I don't know, 20, 30, <laughs> I don't know how many years, it's been a long time. <clears throat> so, I, I agree. And it, it was, um, it was completely siloed. I know that there were professors at LSU that tried to bridge that gap before. And there was, there was resistance because I think because a lot of the times professors walk in and they have a regimented set of tools that they use. Yeah. They have an agenda that's their agenda and not an athletics agenda right. to try and forward their research ideas where we approached it a lot differently. You know, Jack and I and Shelly sat down in our first meetings and said, 
you know, how can we help the athletes? What are the tools that we have that we can help you to, to help the athletes health and well being? And, and it really started simple, it really started with some really simple research and has built into a, into this really connected program. Now that's unique. You know, you don't see a lot of this around the United States, around the world. I think you see a lot more in England with soccer and kinesiology mm -hmm. research, but not a whole lot in the United States. No, you're, you're exactly right. I know that Europe's a totally different model because they actually look at, they call exercise sport, right? You know, physical activity is sport to them. Sport is yep. not an event. It is what you do every day, sport. Exactly. And so the sports scientists are there's actual schools just for sports like it's a sport university exactly <laughs> you go to a full university and there's just sport it's right. it's amazing yep so what what i you hit the nail on the head i think with the agenda side i think it goes both ways right so you have the scientist coming in here who says i have my agenda and this is what i'm interested in this yeah. is my line of research this is my funding and this is what i like to do and then but don't forget, you got the coach over here who says, you ain't touching my athletes. <laughs> right. When when we had to do research, luckily right. I did my research, my master's at Mississippi State um, on the baseball team because I happened to be the student trainer there, the graduate. Right. Student, yeah. So I had access. But I did my PhD at LSU with Jack in the training room with, with Melissa Thompson um, under Dr. Dennis Landon. Yep. And luckily we had Jack supported us a hundred percent we went in we did fluoroscopy of the shoulder while we did exercises and this was of our yeah. overhead athletes granted it wasn't invasive it wasn't training yeah, right. it was just a you know a, a real-time evaluation but there all are always going to be coaches that get paranoid about well don't mess with my athletes and yeah. what you guys did was you broke that mold yeah. right on both sides which is the key to making these relationships work uh, you you make an excellent point because it is it is it's one thing for athletic trainers to sit down with sports scientists and say this is things that we can look at you know the the fortunate thing that we've really had is we've had coach buy in mm -hmm. you know, because they've allowed us on the field yep. during close scrimmages in our football team to to collect data right mm -hmm. which nobody else has access to you know right. you can walk out there and the coaches see you they know you um they're shaking your hand they're thanking you for the for the help that you're trying to give them they understand the process and that has to come from trust in them in their in their athletic trainers like shelly and jack i mean yep. without the coaches trusting them with their athletes like there's no way that this this connection works because i walk in and you know i see at the time it was less miles or now it's coach O, and they're hey Hey, Neil, how you doing? They shake your hand. Thank you for everything you're doing. You're helping. Her. And for me, I'm going, oh, you know, it's, it's Coach O, right? And, and they're just like, hey, we're just, we're just happy to see people that are really interested in helping our athletes. And, and, and you know, and, and it's really helping them with health and wellness is really our, been our, our directive the whole time. I mean, and we've always been at LSU, this kind of hotbed for heat illness, right? I mean, yeah. we're a Petri dish for, for heat exhaustion. Right. And more recently, the things you guys have been doing, like with concussions um, and of course, you know, going into your world of hydration. Um, what, is there anything you could tell us about some of the things you've been doing with them recently? Yeah, um, we've actually published, I think, four or five papers in the last year on on some of the the different research projects. Now we have. Huh, a lot of research that's, that's ready to come out. Uh, you mentioned the concussion study. Uh, this one actually had to go in front of the, the LSU lawyers. We, we yeah. sat down with Shelly and I and, and, and Jack and, and talked with the lawyers at LSU because they thought, well, are you, and this is, this is really the foresight that, that the coaching staff and that the athletics department at LSU has, right? There were, you know, a lot of people were worried about well, if we find something, then they're going to blame LSU. They're going to sue LSU athletics. We're going to try and go out. Whereas they were like, whoa, back up. We're trying to understand what's happening under the current guidelines for the athletes so that we can make improvements to our helmets, to our practices, right. to, our, <clears throat> to our workouts, to our, if it, even if it is hydration, mm -hmm. in order to hopefully in the future prevent 
things like concussion and, you know, head injuries and ACL injuries and um, heat related illnesses and so on. You know, I think it, you talked about hydration and, and that was really where we started. <laughs> I mean, it, crazy enough, right? We were meeting with them and, and at the time they saw a lot of people that had, that had heat related heat cramps. Mm-hmm. And that, now you've seen it too. When, when I talk about heat cramps, I don't mean, oh, I got a cramp in my, oh. arm or my leg or the stuff you see on the field most of the time where it's, you know, oh, they're down and they're holding onto their calf. That is not what I conceive as a, as a heat cramp. Heat cramps are these full body yep. locked down where you can't even hardly pry their arm open yep. in order to get an IV in these guys, yep. right? And, you know, when we, when we started our research, they were having problems with this. And it's not just a problem at LSU. This is a problem systematically right sure. across every university, especially in the South. So we thought, well, why don't we just start with salt? Let's see, let's see how much sodium they're losing. Nobody had really put sweat patches on these guys because, well, it's complex, right? It's complicated to get sweat concentrations on football guys when they're out on the field during these practices, right? The coaches are very regimented in, in their procedures and things that they're going to do. And, and I said, well, let's, let's find out what they're losing. So we, you can't put a sweat patch on a football player on their arm because it's going to disappear. Mm-hmm. You can't put it on their neck. <clears throat> so we just, well, the one place we could probably put it is on their back, right? Where, you know, one of the trainers can walk up and athletic trainers can walk up and pick up their back and take these sweat patches off and, you know, put them in a Ziploc bag and figure it out. <laughs> Some of the earliest data we had suggested that these guys were losing up to 10 pounds to 13 pounds per practice, especially the really big guys. Mm-hmm. And they were losing around 10 grams of sodium per practice, wow. per two hour practice. Now, mm-hmm. If you remember the guidelines for salt intake or sodium intake is 2000 milligrams a day. Right. All right. So if you're losing 10 right. grams, right. 10 or 10,000 milligrams in a two hour practice and you're replacing it with two. Right. It doesn't take a genius to go, well, maybe we should give That's them a little right. more salt. That's right. And, and we did. So we started, we started adding, adding some products to, to their beverages, to their, their, I mean, LSU, it's no secret, they're a Powerade school, right? So we'd start to super saturate their Powerades with, with salt. And we'd give them, you know, pickles on the sideline. And we'd give them some other, you know, things and, and, and try to reinforce that. And you're talking about, you know, everyone gets so freaked out about sodium, right? Because they're worried, oh, they got high blood pressure. and They're going to increase their blood pressure. We're talking about elite athletes here mm-hmm. that, really, that really don't have high blood pressure issues. Right. Right? <clears throat> and... And we saw just by that simple addition, and this paper's coming, by the way, we're writing this paper. Um, we saw we saw a massive reduction in the number of heat cramps or heat related illnesses. And we sort of went, all right, guess we have to do this, right? And then of course, Matt Flynn comes back into the picture with yeah. his product. You know, he's now created My High. Yep. If you want to see it, and My High is, is a beverage that, you know, Matt Flynn evidently suffered with heat related cramps when he was in in football and in professional football. And he's really, you know, gone for, for that to try and find that circle where he, he has products. Now you can add directly into pro, uh, to power aid or other to increase the sodium content. And, mm-hmm. and it, it seems to work, you know, we don't have near the, the hydration issues that we've had had in past years. <clears throat> I think that, that is the key though, Neil, is you showed success, right? So imagine the scientist that goes out there and says, I'm gonna do all this testing on your athlete. They come back and say, oh, I don't know what to do, coach. How much, right. how much is that uh, value and that trust gonna be instilled in that coach and that whole staff yeah. or even the athlete, right? right. So and it, we've had that happen. We've had that where we've done research and yeah. what we thought was was going on really wasn't happening. And and then you check that off your list. Okay, it's not this. Right. right. And let's move on to the next procedure. And what's the next thing that we can think of? And 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 I mean, this this athletics research team that we have, you know, going on right now is really forward thinking. I mean, they're right. they're thinking about you know possible issues that are that are down the line in terms of even biologics that they use. You know, stem cells and A two M and some other some other um, biologics that may help soft tissue healing and, and, you know, and, and joint healing. Yeah. And that was the point I was, as I was thinking about that, you didn't give up. 
right? You, you, you forward thinking, you, you checked it off the list. You said it perfectly. You just check it off the list. Now, a lot of times people just say, well, I don't know what to do now. You know, this <laughs> cramping thing, we'll just give them Valium or something. I mean, that's right. what we're going to do. <laughs> that's what we used to do. Right. No, you're right. No, you're exactly old days, right. I didn't, what do you do? Because I had those athletes that were, that were doing this tonic spasticity and you couldn't, yep. and it was, it was scary to watch. Yeah. And yeah, all you can do is, is pop a Valium in them. We could put two large bore IVs in them. But again, that's yeah. after the fact, right? Yeah. We needed something that, that I'm glad that, that you did, you know, find out more of what we can do because this has been a problem. I mean, in the pickle juice thing, right? <laughs> pickle juice. Pickle juice. You know, I wish I, wish I could have. I want to mention one of my buddies now that from high school. Right. Harold Hastings was, was a wrestler in Miller high school in the middle of South Dakota. Right. <laughs> and I'm doing my, I'm doing my, my dissertation research. And he calls me, he says, Neil, you have to do hydration research with pickle juice. Now this was before the pickle juice craze, right? <laughs> Way before the pickle juice craze, Neil, you need to do this pickle juice research. You've got to do. It. And I, I walked into Rick Sharp's office and and at that point, we had three or four studies going on. We were really, our bandwidth was really small. And, and it sort of got put on the back burner. And we, eh, pickle juice, no one's ever going to drink it. No, eh, look where we're at now. I know, they're selling it. <laughs> they sell it in a can. Yeah. Right? Anyway. It's at, yeah, I think I saw it at ACSM a few years ago for the first time. Like, really? Someone yeah. did that? Yeah. Between well, that and chocolate milk, right? Oh, yeah, that's another bit. A side note. Pickle juice is good for blisters, believe it or not. I had, put, had put it on the blister. Or you I drink had it. a pitcher at LSU who had a blister on his pitching finger, and one of the things was you would soak the hands in a jar of pickle juice. No way. Yes. Yes. Um, there you go. Let's. See. <laughs> okay. So, what is it about? Uh, so you're you you basically you come for you went from bench to clinical. What is it about athletics that really stokes your fire that gives you the passion every day to keep yeah. doing what you're doing for those athletes? You know, I, I would mention two things. One is I was an athlete. I mean, and this, I was, I was born in an era and raised in an era where you didn't do one sport. You know, I went from football to basketball to track and field to baseball to football mm -hmm. to bat right we played four sports when i was growing right. up and i mean granted it's in small town south dakota and, and it may be more difficult to have the talent down in this area obviously the athletes um there's a different a different form of athlete here than, than at least on average mm -hmm. than where i grew up now when i grew up you had some amazing athletes too but i think on average over the sports are different you know and and being an athlete growing up and being an athlete in college, like you see, you see the effects of the athletic trainers can have on athletes. Mm -hmm. You see, you see the limitations that are out there in terms of just the anecdotal data, right? The anecdotal things that are out there, you know, um, that, that coaches do that trainers may do that really isn't supported by science. Mm -hmm. You know, um, everybody was on the potassium craze intake, the potassium, not sodium. And, you know, right. Do you get back to that? Right. Oh, and you tell athletes they have to walk around with a jug of water all day. And that's all they should do is, is drink water all day. And they'll be perfectly hydrated, you know, and, and some of this anecdotal stuff that's around that, that really doesn't have much science behind it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and especially in terms of, I mean, I, I had knee injuries, so I had, I had a, a torn meniscus in high school. I tore my ACL in college and, and to see one, the effectiveness of the athletic trainers can have on athletes and the influence, not just on their, on their physical health, but on their mental health too, right? You're, you've taken somebody who's invested their whole life into a sport and all of a sudden they get injured or they're out of sport. And the psychological things that happen in those athletes, really, the athletic trainers are really on the foreline of that, right? They get to see and help these athletes through those, those parts. Um, but but to, 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 to be around athletes all the time and to have injuries and, you know, and, and to see the science, that's where I really, my initial feelings toward this goes, right? And that's where I was talking about Matt Vukovic when we were talking about exercise physiology as a, as a career. That's really where my interest started. It's like, wow, I can use medicine and I can do research and I can really help 
people, right? Athletes and, and you know, individuals with, with cardiovascular disease and so on all together. So that's, that's really where it started. What keeps it going though is, is being able to work one in a, in a huge elite athletics program like, like LSU and to have the coaching and athletic training support here. Mm-hmm. And it's the people. You know, it's the, it's the people I get to work with and, and, you know, anywhere from the kinesiology professors like Guillaume Spielman, who's our exercise immunologist, and he does a ton of stuff that's amazing stuff with the athletes, um, to, to Jack and Shelly and Derek and Mickey and all these, right, all these trainers that are over there every day that, that mm-hmm. you know, are, are looking for ways that they can help their athletes get better. And, and from health and wellness comes performance in, in our book. And that's really sort of been our mantra the whole time mm-hmm. that we've been doing this, right? If we can help their physical and mental health and we can help their wellness, they're going to perform better. They're right. going to be better people. They're going to be better athletes. They're going to be able to, to, to endure, you know, the, the stresses that they put on their bodies every single day. So yeah, that's think- really where it comes from. I, I love working with the people, honestly, I, I told you offline, like, I don't make, I don't make any money doing this. It doesn't hit my checkbook. It doesn't, you know, pad my expenses. Right. It doesn't do anything. It really is just out of, out of the, the drive to help, to help these people. Uh, and I, I, that goes without saying for anybody involved in athletics, except for the, some of the coaches and athletes, you know, us guys on the, in the trenches, on the front lines, we're working yeah. seven days a week. 24 yeah. hours a day as athletic trainers, sports, physical therapists, team physicians. You know, yeah. I, I listened to Dr. James Andrews podcast and it was, he was like one of the fathers of, of doing this under Jack Houston, yeah. that, that crew. And he had these great things that go into being involved in athletics. And it's like communication and availability, right? You know, you've got to be present. And yeah. when you said you're like at the practices and stuff and coaches recognize you, that's really important. Yeah, stuff. that's fun. And you don't get paid more to do it, but you do the things a little bit extra, right? We do a little lanyap here. Yeah. You, you, you South Dakota people don't know what lanyap is. <laughs> I've been here 15 years. I know. Bro. I, I'm understanding lanyap more and more every day. <laughs> um, and, you know, we started the conversation, like you said, offline about, it's it really starts with performance health not enhancement and you got to have the health before the enhancement yeah and i think that what you've done with science and that's where science really plays i think the biggest role is like you said which is interesting you all these things are getting done that have no basis and athletics is a huge part of that with tradition and you know uh, we've always done it that way that always takes me back to salt tablets as early <laughs> as the 80s right. using salt right. tablets, no water breaks. And what did yeah. we find was through research that that is not the right thing to do Right through, through all the, the science behind it. The other side and kind of parallel or, or in, same with that nutritional research is really where a lot of the, the myths and things get stuck. We talked about, uh, well, phosphocreatine was one of the big ones. Right. You yeah. Know? Um, and these are all nutritional supplements, pickle juice, all this stuff. And what people do is they commercialize those things and they twist the science a little bit. Yeah. And they make these inferences, these assumptions, these leaps of faith, these logical fallacies, and people yeah. buy into them. Yeah. Right? And, and how do you and combat that-, that stuff? No, and athletes that, I mean, you have to understand these are elite athletes, right? These guys are the top 1% of the top 1% of the people. And their performance differences are not like Miller, South Dakota football, right? You can look at somebody and go, yeah, they're good, they're bad. Here, they're all amazing athletes, right? The difference between, you know, the super athletes and their backup on the field is this much, right? So they're fighting for a fraction of a percent of difference in their performance in order to be a starter, to go to the NFL, Mm -hmm. to go to the NBA, WNBA, right? Elite league soccer, wherever they're going to head. And, and, you know, these, these companies use that, Mm -hmm. use that to their advantage and sell products sometimes that just don't, 
they, they don't have the research to support it. And when they do the research, and this is what, you know, we talk about all the time in our, in our little circles is, you know, when you, when you do the research, a lot of the research is done on, on people that are athletic, right? They're athletic people. Yeah. They are not elite athletes, you know, and the, the statistical terms, right? The effect size difference in those people with the nutritional supplement might be this big, right? In other words, the, the mean differences between control or placebo and the, the treatment may be really large because they're not at that elite level. But when you have elite athletes where the performance difference is this much, the effect size difference for something feeding them omega-3 fatty acids, feeding them beet juice, feeding them, you know, whatever is going to be really small. Right? It's going to be really difficult to detect that significant difference or even that meaningful difference on the field with these supplements, but, but they buy into it, mm -hmm. right? They buy into the, the creatine supplements. They buy into the, although creatine is one that's got some decent research behind it that shows some effects, but, but the second it hits the market and it, makes money for somebody the data becomes polluted in my opinion yeah yeah i i agree i i have a passion for researching products and things that help people I, i'll see a good product out there that doesn't really have a lot of, of good research i'll see some bad products that claim to have good research and that really I, it irks me right. that they that they what i they're basically bastardizing science you know, they're exploiting science for profit. That is a big pet peeve right. of mine. Right. And so when I look at helping companies understand what's good and bad is important, but the consumers are the ones that are still getting shafted because they're being fed right. these things. And you, you mentioned right. the, the elite athlete part of it is really important, which is one of the issues we, we need to do more research on these athletes, right? right? If you, if you're, I've probably heard of magnitude based inferences mm -hmm. um, yep. years yep. ago, which has kind of come under fire in the past few years that I think it was kind of overused a little bit, but the philosophy is the same thing. The difference of a sprinter running a second faster, right? right is that much more of a gold medal versus a yeah. silver medal. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. that magnitude based inference or effect size, but yeah. yet all we're doing is still look at these damn P values. <laughs> right. The oh, you mean you're 90, you're 95% sure that you made the right decision to reject right. the null hypothesis. Really? Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's base our, our decisions on that. Yeah. And, and that's what I was saying, but the, the difference between the significance, right? A significant right. difference versus a physiologically meaningful change. Correct. You know, I think significance the, is the worst word we could have ever chosen for the p-value. <laughs> people think that significant but, is a lot. But people live and die by it. They do. I have, you can go look at, I have a paper out there where we looked at feeding chicken soup, right? Before exercise in the heat. And we had a p-value of 0 0.052. Point now, I could have pushed the data. Probably, I could have justified rounding. You could have p hacked your way, or done something, right? Yeah, p hack it, you know. And and I probably could have pushed the data to get a point zero four nine. Yeah, but I didn't. And I I submitted the paper, submitted the paper, and I said, you know, there was a significant change in whatever, and I caught hell from the reviewers yeah. because they said there's no way. There's no way you can do, you know, it's not significant. It's not less than P.05. And I went, oh. You couldn't just round it down, right. could you? The effect size was something like 1.0. Wow. Right, between, the, between the beverages. But right. the sample size was nine people. Yeah. So, of course, the P value is going to be low. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Did you ever hear the, the saying that surely God loves P less than 0 0.049 <laughs> as much right. as 0 0.05, right? Right. You would think. You would think. Yeah. The, um, this has been, this has just been fun and we could go on nerding out on stats and all that for, for a long time. Um, we'll probably bore a lot of people, but that's actually where I, my passion is in that whole scientific literacy side of yeah. things. Um, and it's really refreshing to see the impact that you've made with your ability to work with those athletes. Yeah. And it, it's a tremendous honor. I'm not, it's I'm like, kudos to you 
for breaking that mold along with it. I know it comes with the coaches, the trainers, the athletes. Yeah. It's a team thing that you're blessed to be part of. And I'm just so happy that you're here to share that with us. My pleasure, Phil. I, I do want to mention a couple more things before I end because I got to give some plugs to, to the people that really help a lot with our research. Sure. You know, I mentioned Gene Spielman before. I mentioned Jack and Shelly and, you know, Derek Calvert and Mickey and, you know, these people that help with boots on the ground. But, you know, we we have a really unique relationship with athletics in another way. Um, I was approached by by the head of the orthopedic center for the Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, Dr. Bob Zura. And he just he came up and met with Jack and I and just said, you know what, we want to help you all. We want to help you any way we can with your research. We think your research is really cool. It's really novel and, and helps us by, by giving us an open position. Nathan Lemoyne right now is our, our sitting uh, scientific liaison and, and researcher at, at LSU Athletics, which we talk about these unique collaborations and unique bridges. He's really a unique bridge in that we have him sitting in athletics helping with the research, boots on the ground, funded by a collaborator to do nothing but help us to, to build these relationships and build out this research protocol, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> and then the Pennington Biomedical Research Center does an amazing job. You know, we, we do a lot of our stuff, a lot of our blood samples for some of our basic analyses through Jen, Jennifer Rood's lab. Uh, and she she's the one that really is at the forefront of tactical athlete research and the DOD that we also collaborate with, but she gives us a lot of, a lot of input into, into our, our scientific um, uh, background and what we do. She helps us work within the system at Pennington to do like functional MRIs for concussions in our football players. She helps with, she runs the clinical lab over there and, and really is an, an, an outstanding resource and, and collaborator with us at, at the Pennington Center, along with Tiffany Stewart. And Tiffany Stewart is really in the mental health side of, of the research, uh, works a lot with Shelly, collaborates with us on some of our, our research and looking at the, the mental health of, of athletes, um, especially female athletes who have some, some body image um, awareness um, that, that the male athletes really don't, don't deal with a lot. But, you know, those are some major players that we have and, and couldn't do our research without them. You know, they, they're always on our boards. They're always, you know, giving us feedback. And then obviously Tim church, who, when I started the athletes at athletes research, he's the first one I called he and Conrad Ernest and said, Hey, they might actually want to do research. What should we do? Right. And, right. and helped us with our, helped us with our, um, our initial, our, our initial studies. And, you know, Tim, Tim church is a, a medical doctor as well as a PhD that does research and, mm gives us that that medical edge to a lot of the stuff that that we do so there's my plugs if i forgot somebody i'm really sorry for right. but it's like you know going, um, going to the oscars huh <laughs> that's right the music's playing the music's that's right playing neil we gotta okay. yeah and i have to mention brian irving too you know and this is in the athletic training realm we're doing some stuff now with blood flow restrictive exercise mm -hmm. um in order to help help to get athletes back on the field and back on the field not just faster but but in a better condition. And, and Brian Irving is our, our, um, our metabolic person here at LSU. And he does the BFR research with athletics and with, within his lab. That's really cool. He's he far and away way smarter than I am in, in doing this research in, in that arena. So anyway, there's my plugs. That's, that's fantastic. It's funny. It's funny how you, <clears throat> you, you, you've kind of helped to make research fun, right. And, and where people are now coming and going, hey, we want to be part of this. We want this yeah. sounds cool. It's like, wow, you think us researchers, us, us scientists, might actually have this thing where we're we're revenge of the nerds, right? That we're going to be cool now. <laughs> we get to be the cool kids, right? The cool nerds. Yeah. <laughs> you know? exactly. I, I do. I actually do think that I'm a cool nerd. I tell my kids that all the time, and say, Dad, no, you're just a nerd. Okay. Yeah, so, my kids call me a dork. It's a dork. Right. There you go. Okay, nerd is from my generation. Dork right. is probably from your generation. <laughs> right. Neil, yeah. thanks so much. This has been fantastic. Awesome. Guys, thank you uh, for joining us on this podcast. I hope it's been beneficial. And even though, you know, some of our Tulane students will see this, I'll still say go Tigers. Go Tigers. All right. Take care, Neil. <laughs> thanks a lot, Phil. Bye-bye.